Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. In a country where we're told we will soon change jobs every two years or so, Sister Mary June Morin is a glorious anachronism. For nearly 50 years, she's been at work at St. Mary's Home for Disabled Children. She's the only one of the original 21 sisters assigned there in 1960 who is still on the job. Lisa Godley strapped on her track shoes and followed Sister Mary June through a typical day to see and hear more about her remarkable journey and legacy. Sister really is kind of the heart and soul of St. Mary's. Powerful words describing an amazing woman who has dedicated her life to making the lives of disabled children better. The least fortunate, really, the kids that need most care. Usually I tend to go to them. For the last 50 years, Sister Mary June Morin has been caring for children at St. Mary's Home for Disabled Children and loving it. Yeah. Children like 17-year-old Tommy, who she's taken care of since he was a toddler. Tommy was maybe two, two and a half, maybe, and they couldn't get him to take his bottle. And they would ask me if I would come at his night and see if I could, could take it for me. And I make it, made it a purpose just on his nap time to come pick him up and rock him, talk to him, give him his bottle. And then I go back to the nurses and said, here, his bottle is all finished. And I said, he also, also took two ounces of water on top of that. But now he's bigger than I am, so he's, he's doing great. Sister Mary June joined the Daughters of Wisdom in 1951. Back then, the nuns still wore their habits, but that changed in 1964, which she loved, because she says it made it a lot easier when working with the children. Sister Mary June grew up in Madawaska, Maine, and was the third youngest of 12 siblings. She says she knew as early as the sixth grade what God was calling her to do. So after graduating from high school, she immediately began her religious training and took her vows two years later. After working for seven years at a clinic in New York that performed surgeries on children, she came to St. Mary's Infant Home in Norfolk. Since her arrival, St. Mary's has moved twice, but has always provided a loving environment for children. And Sister Mary June has played a vital part in that. She always wants to make sure that the children are well cared for, and she takes her time to stop in and talk to each one. She just always makes sure that they have their clothes that they need, even buying clothes for kids personally. One thing that her friends at St. Mary's can attest to is that Sister Mary June keeps them grounded and makes sure they always remember one thing. This is not a hospital. The children, because they are very medically fragile, require a lot of medical care. But we have to provide that medical care, realizing this is still their home. Because many of the children are so severely ill, some don't make it. And when we do lose a child, I mean, we feel it. We feel it just as much as the parents do, really, because they're part of your family, their family. For the family at St. Mary's, Sister Mary June has dispelled the stereotypical image of a nun being stern and strict. They say she's a notorious practical joker who is always surprising them. She decided to come in and apply for a job as a nurse. So she put on a wig, she put on a, a suit coat and a skirt and heels, and if you knew Mary June, she just doesn't usually dress like that. Um, and she came in to apply for a job. People who saw her every day for years didn't even recognize her. Um, so they sent her back for the interview. She filled out an application, and she just had everybody fooled. And at the end, she walked out of the building, and then she came back and identified herself, and everyone was just astounded that she pulled that over on all of us. As for when St. Mary's last remaining nun will call it quits, Sister Mary June says, as long as she can do the work, why not? For What Matters, I'm Lisa Godley. And we're happy to have joining us tonight, Sister Mary June Moran. Nice to see you, and thank you for being here. Well, I'm happy to be here. Uh, we should note, <laughs> we were actually scheduled to record this show a couple of weeks ago, and this is a true story. This is uh, how you know these, this is live TV to some extent, right? About two hours before we were to tape the broadcast, you were taken to the hospital, and uh, they, they were very concerned about you. I went to the emergency room that same day. But then I told them at 10 o'clock I was feeling better. Maybe I still could do it at 10 o'clock. <laughs> but 
they decided three o'clock. perhaps not. Yeah. yeah, doctor walks in, he says, see the door there? There's no way you're going out there. No not way. Not going to happen. So. so then surgery was the next day. Yeah, so you've had some uh, some surgery and all is well, and thank goodness for that. All is fine. And that's just been a couple of weeks ago, so you really have yeah. made a pretty right. dramatic recovery. Right. Well, we're glad to have you with us tonight, and thank you so much for... Uh, for, for doing the, the show with us. We wanted to have this opportunity to sit down and have an extended conversation <laughs> because your life is so interesting and the work that you've done at St. Mary's has been so interesting. And so we told people we were interviewing a nun, people had all kinds of questions. So I hope you don't mind if I ask you some of those on their behalf. Um, we, Lisa noted in her, pack, in her uh, report that you really knew very early on in your life what the call was. Right, uh, sixth grade, yeah. from my sixth grade on I had a sister that taught me school and my sixth grade as a teacher. No other ones, they were all lay people uh, from six to, well, seventh grade really to the senior year. And uh, every time I would see the sisters coming in one way, I would go the other way. <laughs> kind of avoid them because I knew what they were getting. So one day she sent a young boy to the house and said that sister wanted to see me. And I gave an excuse. I said, tell them I'm busy right now. I can't go. <laughs> so after three times, I said, I better go see what she wants. And then she kind of knew that, you know, that I was fit to be a sister. And my mother kind of surmised it, too. Uh, but well, never... was it her knowing it or was it you knowing it or was it was it I both knew of those? I knew it uh -huh. uh, I, I kind of you know off and on I didn't know if I wanted it if I didn't want it it was it really what I wanted so I was in but it it always was always focused right. I was always focused on it and so when you say you didn't know whether you wanted or maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Well, you, what you sorts of fighting. questions? Yeah, if you're, you're, you're sixth grade, it. what are you what are you thinking? What questions? You know, are you, you were fighting with yourself. You know, yeah. like, do I really want this? Do I want this? What do I want? Because my mother always said I was a tomboy. Uh huh. And <laughs> because I was always in sports, and uh, she said to me, "You'll never make it." When I told her I was going to be a sister, I wanted to be a sister. She said, "Well." I'm not going to stop you, uh -huh. but she said, uh, you know, I, you'll never make it. So I went in. <laughs> kind of some, I said, when my father was sitting on the porch, she said, well, you go tell your father. <laughs> he was sitting on the porch. So I went, I went out on the porch and told Dad. I said, Dad, I would like to become a sister. And he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, well, June, he always called me June, he said, this is your decision. I'm not going to stop you. But just remember, you always have a home Aww. to come back to. And with this, he had big tears rolling Aww. down his eyes. That was the first time I had seen him crying. Wow. And I said, wow. And this was like, I graduated June the 14th, and I entered July the 31st. Wow, that's pretty In 51, bad. in 51. But you know that's a remarkable thing. I think when because that's a great story of the ways in which, if you if you give a child the sense that they're safe and they have a place to come back to, yeah. and and th then it almost gives them permission to try something that right. they still might be a little bit hesitant or reticent right. about. But uh, you know, I entered, and I had a, a brother who was going to be a brother in oh. Ipswich, Massachusetts, but he didn't make it. Said so he'll make it. But you won't. <laughs> he came out, and I'm still in. I said, see, Mom, I'm here. I am. Staying power, right? <laughs> see, Mom, I'm still here. <laughs> so you were number nine of 12 children, I think. Is that the right? The third youngest. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So that's, uh, right. so wow, by the time you get to number nine. And I never told them, because no brothers how they are. They would tease the life out of me. Yeah. And I never told them until the very last minute. Oh, isn't that interesting? Uh, because they were teasers, to, yeah. you know. When that you might be where you get the practical joke. When you have not. six brothers, well, my father was a joker to begin with, yeah. too. So, I mean, when you have six brothers, and uh, you know, <laughs> so you, you kept away from them. Yeah, <laughs> and you lived uh, walking distance, just about five minutes from the Canadian border. I have right? one foot on the Canadians. The only thing that separates us is St. John's River. I see. Which is not very wide. Uh, it's and not you have a, a charming accent. It's a French. 
And it's a sort of a patois uh, kind of a thing. It's a French accent. Uh, a lot of people ask me where I'm from, and I, I said, well, I'm from Maine, uh, from Madawaska. And uh, Madawaska's name is a porcupine name. <laughs> That's how they call it, Madawaska. It's a French Acadian and ah, okay. the Arista County. And uh, so the accent has just stayed all these. It stayed. I never lost my accent. Yeah. But when I speak, I have to learn, you know, first get in French, and then it comes into English. Oh, is that right? So it takes Still? A little, wow. So it takes a little longer for me to uh, oh, isn't that get interesting? it in. Yeah. Oh. I think first French, and then it becomes English. Oh, isn't that interesting? So you, mm. you, you had weeks between high school and uh, going. Just about it, a month. And, and so, so what is that process like? Can you explain well, that process? Well, I was preparing. Preparing, you know, you had to get your, your things ready, your clothes, and then when you left home, you had to be dressed as a postulant, which was a black dress. You to had, the floor? Yeah. Uh -huh. Then you had a crucifix, a little cross. Uh, then one little tan, what you call a tan, uh, mm -hmm. beret. And uh, you left like that. You were dressed like that. And then one of the sisters accompanied us to the novitiate, which was in Litchfield, Connecticut. So the novitiate then, is sort of uh, would be the place is a where training center. Training center. Okay. You had like six months postulancy, six months as a junior novice, mm -hmm. and then six months as a senior novice. Then after that, you you did your first vows. Was there any point in that process where you said mm, maybe not, maybe this is not for me? And not really. So when you did your first vows, then you were free every for five years. After five years, every year you were able to renew your vows. Now you had a chance either to go oh, or to renew your vows for five years. Sort of a re-enlistment kind of a deal, huh? Uh, more or less, yeah. yeah. Then after five years, I went to France oh. for my uh, final vows. That's Saint Laurent de Sèvres. Uh, that's our mother house in France. And then you did your perpetual vows there. And how did you choose? You chose uh, Daughters of Wisdom. Right. Right? And, right. and so that is a, that's a choice that a novitiate makes. Is that right? No. Uh, well, you have so many sisters. Uh, Daughters of Charity. There's right. Notre Dame de Namur. You have Providence Sisters. You have, you have so many names, mm -hmm. congregations. It's not the same. They're so do you get to pick which one you go into? Yes. Or? yes. So you chose Daughters of right. Wisdom. Well, they were, we had those at home. Oh, I in see. Madawaska. So that was what was familiar. Yeah. So I was more familiar with the Daughters of Wisdom than any of the other congregations, uh, which I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. Although my cousin, who lived across the street from me, was entering the same age. We graduated at the same time she was entering. And she was supposed to come with me. And uh, the last minute, then she changed. She went to be a Franciscan. Oh, interesting. And she said to me, why don't you come with me? I said, no, you go your way and I'll go mine. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> so she's a Franciscan. She's yeah. still in. And um, I became a daughter of wisdom. Yeah. And I'm still in. <laughs> and you're still in. Boy, are and you I'm ever. I'm still in. <laughs> there is no question about that. That mm. is a fact. Uh, that is a fact. So how is it that you got eventually to St. Mary's? OK, after your first vows. Uh, from Litchfield, uh, they give you a mandate, what they call an obedience or a mandate. Like you don't choose, say, I want to go here, I want to go there. They, they send they you. They send you oh. where the need, where the help is needed. And you have to be willing to go, right? Right. That's, yeah. So I was sent to Brooklyn, New York, uh, in a clinic, St. Charles Clinic, which is a clinic. The doctors did surgery there. Children were in big casts. Uh, and then they also got, had their therapies done over there. So I was there for seven years. And I worked in the kitchen with two elderly sisters. But then after a year or two, then I was head of the kitchen with a younger sister, a year younger than me that came. So the two of us were in the kitchen. After, in 1960, February the 8th, 60, then the need was needed here mm. at St. Mary's. One of the elderly sisters was leaving to go to New York, so I was to replace her. So I came. So how old were you at that point? 26. Wow. I was young. Yeah. <clears throat> Still young. <laughs> so I came in by train by, at that time. The train was by St. Mary's Academy, right behind the right, depot, yeah. was right there. And uh, 
I had another sister coming down with me. And uh, when we came, then I saw this big, huge building. I said, oh, Lord, what is this? I had no idea. It was a school, apparently, that the Daughters of Charity had. And it had been closed for about maybe 25, 30 years. So uh, before they opened that, then the priest, the pastor at uh, St. Mary's Church, Monsignor Heller, had a baby left at the door. And that's how they decided they would open uh, that place that was really? closed to be, to be a home. So what happened is that he was looking mm. for a community that would, they would take that uh, on. be responsible for it. Before that, they had lay people. They started with 11 children. Mm. So you can imagine a school, they had nothing. They had no beds, no linens, n food. Uh, sometimes they made the children in the sink because it was not a, there's no tubs. Yeah. Uh, so were these other children then who were just left along the way or did it just become developing and uh, did there just develop a, a need for children? Well, these children were normal. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a few not normal, but these children were normal children. So they were it was just abandoned time, children. It was the time of the war. Yes. Men were in the service and the women had to work. Mm -hmm. So then the children were kind of neglected mm -hmm. and left on the street. So that's how we got a lot of the children to come in. Wow. And then it also was a time of the unwed mothers. Right. So a lot of those children also came to us. But those children didn't stay long. They stayed maybe a week or two. The sure. children were healthy a week or two, and then they went to the agency, and they were adopted from the agency. And so eventually the, the, the home transitioned into a home for uh, disabled, ch profoundly disabled children um, from, to many extent. I would say we had started with children from age, newborn to age six. These children were normal, mm -hmm. active. Um, and I had charge of that little group, so we used to name the babies Holy Angels. Oh. And the two two year olds up to two, we called them Holy Innocent. And then up past three to six, they were Holy Terrors. <laughs> and they were Terrors. <laughs> They kept you busy. So I had the holy terrors yeah. to take care of. Yeah. Uh, and then from age six, we went to age nine. Uh, and then they started with 11. Then we went to 40 children. Then we wow. went up to 60 children. So where along the line did you really focus the energies and specialize in the care of disabled children? Uh, that, that's been further down the line, right. really. But I mean, it's a profoundly important yeah, ministry, and I, there's so few people doing it. I believe it. Well, nowadays, you know, those children were never known to the people. Yes. They were isolated, and now they're known in schools. They have a special schooling for them, uh, educational. Uh, the school are being bussed out, they're sure. being educated. But before that, they thing. never, you never heard of children being home that needed the care, or you seldom heard that. And I know that one of the one of the great sadnesses that many people it, it's a, such a marvelous facility. First of all, particularly the new facility that is you know, very much state of the beautiful. art. Uh, but 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 one of the sadnesses that people report in visiting there is that so many of the children are there because of uh, abuse or issues that were preventable in some cases. Right. Which and I wonder how you feel about that. <sighs> Well, that's a sad part of it, yeah. really. That's yeah. a sad part of it. But then you look on the other side. These children need special care as much as any of the others. Sure. Uh, you know, so you say to yourself, well, if I had that child at home, what would I do? I'd yeah. give my love to them. I'd care for them. I'd, you know, y you learn from these children. You learn from them. Mm -hmm. uh, they had their own little personality. They know your touch. They know your, your foot. Friends, they know your, you know your voice. Uh, they'll smile. If they can't do anything else, they give you a little smile, a little grin, or they'll mm. just move a little fist or a finger. That's progress for us. Yeah, yeah, that's really progress. You know, so you learn. Like here, we have a headache. We come from home. Oh, land, I have a headache. What can I do? These children sometimes can't say that they're hurting. So mm. you really have to be for them and learn. If they're crying, what what ails what ails them? You know, if they hurt, then you you have to kind of feel their their position, change their position, talk to them, uh, you know, rock them. Mm. Uh, so you, you learn you learn, learn from the children. 
you're the last nun left there. And the last one. The last one standing. So what happens when you, because at some point you'll retire, I'm guessing. I know that's not in your plan at the moment. Well, they, they, they're after me. They say, why don't you retire? I look at them and I said, why retire? I said, you know, age is but a number. Yeah. Years is but a number. And mine is unlisted. <laughs> and uh, I said, if you're still capable of doing the work, why retire? You know, I've cut down one day. So I work three days. I work Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I comes to a point where I say to myself, I can no longer do the work, well then, so be That's it. A different Let deal. it be. But if I still can give to the children, why not? So, if you're the last one, what does St. Mary's, what, what happens to St. Mary's without it? Will there be other nuns coming behind you? I doubt it. And so what, <laughs> I have what my does doubts, that mean uh, for St. Mary's? That will be up to them, really. Mm -hmm. I hope that the atmosphere and the home atmosphere that we gave to the home will continue. Because it's be 65 years in December that the home has been open, and uh, it ha always has had that atmosphere, the happy atmosphere. It is a, a home, very happy place. A home uh, atmosphere, not an institution, right? Not an orphanage, please. Not an orphanage. Yeah. And don't don't you think that that atmosphere uh, has a lot to do with some of the pretty remarkable relatively remarkable progress some of these kids make. These kids that you thought were not going to be able to do anything and then, then they can start to do right. some things. Yeah. You know, I look at this, you know, you treat them as you would treat a normal child. Thinking that they are not really, you know, they're special. But you treat them as if they were like a normal child. Mm -hmm. Who knows how much they can take in? Mm. You don't know how much they can take in. Feed it to them. If they can take it, more power to them. If they can't, then so be it. You know, and as you yeah, point out, yeah. their communication, could, they could be taking things in. Exactly. But just not having the ability to let you know that in exactly. some way. Exactly. Wow. So it's up to you to feed them as much as you can, but keep in mind that they are special and they need extra help. But let them, you know... Uh, feed it to them as much as you can. I was in the the report that Lisa did. I was looking at the the young man there who looks to be about maybe a teenager, and you'd Tommy. had him since he Hi, was baby. a toddler. So where we, he's he's going to be an adult. He's taller than me right now. <laughs> so where does what happens to for a child like that? What's the does he stay? That, at that's the sad part because when they leave the home, what is there open for it? Is there a new home, foster care? which is dotting, you know, because these children are special. To place them into foster home adoption, that's really not mm -hmm. feasible. Uh, looking for a group home, looking for another home into their vicinity is what we aim for as much yeah. as possible. So closer to the family, where the family is going to be. Because between the home and nursing home, our children are chronologically are not ready for a nursing home. Right, right. So there's a gap there between a home and nursing home. There sure there's is. There's a big gap. There's group homes, but how many do we have of group homes? And yeah. then there's a waiting list. There's a huge waiting list anyway, yeah. You have a waiting list, so what happens to these children? That's, that's the sad part, because you do all you can for these children to bring them all the potentials and all the, uh, as much as possible. Then when they leave, what happens? Yeah. Well, you've done remarkable work with you them know. over all of these years, and I, uh, I'm so grateful that you came in. Thank you so much for doing the interview with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. It's been wonderful getting to know you. Well, nice knowing you, too. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the Sister Mary June Morin, who is the last nun of the 21 originally uh, at St. Mary's Home for Disabled Children. Well, that is it for us on this edition of What Matters. We have some other great shows coming your way. We will be glad to send you an e-bit to let you know what we're working on for you. You can sign up at our website, which is whatmatters.tv, or visit us on Facebook. And you can email your comments to us anytime at whatmatters at w Sorry, WHRO.org. You can also write to us at 5200 Hampton Boulevard, Norfolk, Virginia. That's 23508. 
and you can call us at 889-9425. Any way you choose, we are always glad to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching this edition of What Matters. We'll see you next time for another look at what's going on here in Hampton Roads. Thanks for watching. Good night.